All right. Um, let's get started. Uh, all right. So, hi. Um, my name is Trevor Hart. Um, I own my own uh, consulting company. Um, I primarily do geospatial technologies, um, but in some of my previous work, I have used uh, time series databases. Um, and more recently, I started a project uh, which started out just using a relational database um, and then through some uh, ne necessities, um, I moved over to a time series database. So that's what this um, talk's all about. So um, I'm going to just keep the slides like this so that it doesn't overtake the screen. So hopefully that's all right. Um, so just a little background. Um, so the the side project that, that I referred to um, is a remote um, monitoring system um, for um, servers. Uh, it's a little bit of a different focus because I'm focusing on monitoring the infrastructure as well as um, the application tier uh, of the um, services that are running on the hosts. Um, so the whole solution is written in Java. Um, it has a web-based uh, front end. Um, and when I first started this, um, the, the back end um, database was actually H2, um, the embedded database. So this was running as a, a server mode um, using Postgres um, compatibility. So the idea was that um, I would prototype it using H2, and then if I needed to, I could move to, um, to Postgres um, down the track. I've, I've had a lot of success with uh, the H2 database in the past, so it just kind of seemed like a natural fit. Um, and just in terms of data collection, uh, I know this is the IoT stream, but um, the, the data that I'm collecting um, is infrastructure related. So it's CPU and RAM and disk and network. And then on top of that, there's additional things around the application tier, which I'll I'll show you later on um, down the track. So uh, while it's not pure um, IoT, there is a lot of uh, data collection. So the, the agent is collecting data all the time. Uh, every 15 seconds, it will collect um, CPU and RAM and um, disk usage and things like that. Um, <clears throat> but on top of that, uh, for instance, with CPU, it's actually looking at the process level as well, because there are certain processes that I'm monitoring to see how much CPU and RAM they're actually using. So the, what the problem was, um, was that uh, the agent and the um, the design of the of the solution was actually working really well, uh, but um, I had ten hosts that I was monitoring, and after thirty days, um, the the database had already grown to five gigabytes, <clears throat> and querying the data out uh, would actually take minutes, not seconds. Um, so so this was even within indexing and things like that. And, and the only way I could restore uh, any performance was actually to truncate the tables. Um, and w when this was happening, uh, obviously the data ingestion uh, would slow down and start queuing and it, it just wasn't going to work. So, so rather than um, proceed with the original plan of moving to Postgres, um, I looked at some other options. Uh, such as a, a time series database. Um, and that's when I came across um, IoT DB. So what is IoT DB? Um, basically, <clears throat> the the project calls it um, an IoT native database, uh, which is a little bit um, uh, elaborate, I guess. Uh, but, but essentially, um, it, it is a time series database. Um, it's written purely in Java, and it's very lightweight. Um, so it started out as a, um, a research project um, by a university in 2016. And like you can see on the slide, it went into the Apache incubator in 2018. And the first official release came out in 2019. Um, and then more recently, uh, end of last year, it graduated from the Apache incubator to a, a full stream um, Apache project. Uh, the the timeline of the of the the project um, and the releases has been quite um, aggressive. I mean, it's only been out for a short time, <clears throat> literally two years. Um, I 
got started with this uh, early 2020, um, and in, in that time, the, the the releases have come quite fast. <laughs> I'm actually a version behind at the moment, so I, I'm on um, essentially version 11, uh, which is uh, almost a year old now, but um, it, it suits me quite nicely. Uh, but the the release cycle is quite aggressive, and, and the, the team behind the project are, are really good at... Um, uh, you know, pushing out new functionality to to meet needs of uh, of the users, so it, it is um, quite a good project. Um, so, just in terms of uh, why people would use IoT DB, um, it's really easy to deploy. It's easy to set up and run. Um, the the main thing that I was looking for is is the lower disk cost. Uh, so it has some really impressive um, compression. Um, in terms of storing your data. Um, so you end up with a lower disk cost um, and obviously um, keeping that data storage down uh, is is quite uh, quite important. Um, the other thing is that uh, it does have really high throughput for reads and writes, uh, which is important to me and, and especially in terms of reading the data out, which is uh, fantastic. Um, the other thing that kind of attracted me to the project was the fact that there is a JDBC driver for this project. So, so unlike other time series databases, uh, you don't need to have a specific API um, to actually access the database. So pure JDBC um, is fine. Um, so th there are some limitations when it comes to the JDBC driver, but uh, you know most of the time, um, everything that you need to do can be done through SQL-like um, semantics and statements. Um, and the other thing which I haven't um, uh, looked at too much is the ecosystem integration. So, you know, there are a lot of um, integrations with other ecosystems such as Grafana. Uh, so I have had a look at um, uh, the integration with Grafana and, and that was, was really good, but I kind of um, stayed away from Grafana in the end for some of my visualizations. Um, but yeah, there, there are a lot of uh, ecosystem integrations which are of um, very uh, um, interesting um, nature. <clears throat> All right, so um, moving from a relational database to a time series database uh, does require a bit of a shift in um, in how you approach things, uh, especially how you design your schema. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I, I did have uh, exposure to some time series databases in some previous work that I had done, so I, I was familiar with with how these things work but you know for somebody um, uh, coming in and not understanding how a time series database differs from a SQL you know relational database uh, it is quite important to to kind of go over some of these things um, so in the IOTDB documentation they have this um, this diagram um, here where they kind of break out the hierarchy from from the root and then they've got power group and power plant and device and sensor um, this is this is kind of a good way of looking at it um, there are some slight variations which I'll show you later and how I laid out my my schema but uh, you know this is a good starting point um, and essentially the hierarchy is is made up of layers. Um, so at, at the top level of the hierarchy, you have your root. Um, root uh, is not negotiable. It's there. Um, it's the top level uh, parent um, in the in the hierarchy. Um, and then uh, as you go down the hierarchy, essentially what you have are called um, called layers. So you can have one layer or, or many layers. Um, so in, in this particular example, uh, the layers are the power group and the power plant um, and then beneath the the those layers um, essentially is what you have is your device um, so the, the device uh, it's a very important concept um, but the the sort of there is a little bit of baggage which comes with calling it a device um, which you'll see a little bit later on. So essentially what you can think of the device as is being the thing that contains um, a sensor 
or, or something that produces a measurement. So, you know, in this case, it could be a piece of equipment and those pieces of equipment um, collect uh, data. So beneath the devices is what they call um, a sensor. Uh, and the sensor is the actual measurement. So this is where the values are stored, and this is essentially the time series. Um, so for one of these devices, you know, for example, WTO1, um, we're collecting a status and a temperature. So yeah, I, I don't like the term um, sensor because it, it's a little bit misleading in some of the um, work that I do, but the, the two things that are important here um, are the device and the sensor. So you, you do need to keep those into in, in the back of your mind um, when we look at some of the examples further down the track. Okay, so so here's a, a little bit more of a, a real world um, example of, of a hierarchy. Um, obviously, you've got your got your root. Um, you've got your your layer, which is your your car manufacturer, so your Honda and your Ford, um, and then you've got your device, which is the the car basically. So you know we've got a Honda Jazz and we've got a Honda Civic, um, and and those devices um, both collect uh, information, right? So both of them will be collecting speed, uh, both of them will be connect, you know, collecting engine temperature, uh, battery voltage, tire pressure. Um, so there is some commonality between them, but they don't have to have the, the same sensors. So for example, if we had a, um, uh, a hybrid or an EV, um, car, uh, under the Honda layer, uh, it may collect, um, additional information about the battery management system. Um, you know, it, it wouldn't have a, a fuel gauge, you know, a fuel measurement. So just because they're both cars um, they can have commonality and sometimes they won't have commonality but um, just remember that the device is the thing that is uh, collecting the data and then the sensor is essentially all of the readings that you're recording in the um, in the database so in terms of um, how I set um, my uh, schema up for collecting uh, infrastructure information. Um, I'm essentially collecting uh, information based on organization um, and then hosts. So uh, we have organization. There are a couple of layers um, in between, which you'll see later on. Um, unfortunately, the the diagram in the, um, in the PowerPoint uh, only has four colors, so I couldn't uh, put in some additional layers there. But essentially, like like I showed you with the uh, the cars, uh, we have our server, which is collecting information about CPU and RAM and network send and network received. Um, <clears throat> so it's pretty straightforward when you think about it like that. Um, <clears throat> so the key takeaways about uh, sort of the anatomy of the time series database is that you know root is your absolute parent. Um, the layers create your your hierarchy, so a logical hierarchy. Um, devices uh, is the kind of the most important thing, um, and you'll see why shortly. And then the sensor um, or the time series is where you actually store the value. So a device has multiple values stored against it. Um, and like I say here, the the sensor you can think of that as a field in a table. So you know in a in a relational world, you would have a table and then you would have a column where you would put the values in. So that's what um, the sensor is. It's essentially a, a column in a table. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of uh, data types that um, you can store in your sensor column, <laughs> um, you know, we've got uh, um, data types uh, such as Boolean, integers, floats, doubles, text. Um, so, so just kind of your, your basic um, uh, primary data types there. Uh, and then the other thing which is important is, uh, like I mentioned earlier about the compression. So when you set up your uh, your time series, uh, you can actually nominate different um, compression algorithms. So I think the default is, is snappy um, and that's proved um, really good for me. But obviously there are other options there like uncompressed and um, LZ4, uh, but obviously they would have different overheads in, in actually reading and writing your data. 
So in terms of getting started, um, it is really easy to get started. Um, the the quick start uh, on the IOTDB website is really good and it will walk you through um, actually getting things up and running. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's no UI to speak of, um, but I will show you something that I put together. Um, but there is a command line interface, so uh, a lot of the demos that I'll show you in a minute will actually be using the command line um, interface. But essentially, once you have the server up and running and the command line interface up, you can go ahead and create your create your time series. So when when we talk about creating the time series, we talk, we're really talking about creating um, that hierarchy uh, of the layers and the device and the sensor. Um, so that would make up the time series. So you would create you know one or more time series. So uh, going back to the example of um, the cars, uh, a time series would be you know root dot Honda dot Civic dot speed. Um, so that it's that um, fully qualified path uh, to that um, to that time series. Um, one of the really nice things about um, IoTDB is that there is a flag um, which you can set in the configuration which enables um, basically auto create schema. So if I turn that on uh, or set that flag to true uh, and I insert data, um, it will automatically create that schema for you, which, which is really good, especially if um, if your data is not set. So in my particular case, um, if somebody deploys an agent onto a new server, um, I don't know anything about that server, so I don't know what their device name is or anything like that. Um, so they can just start up the agent. It will start pushing the data through and the schema will automatically be created. So that's something which is uh, really useful for me because I don't need to know ahead of time what that schema is going to look like. Uh, and you know, once once you've got your time series up and running, or you've got auto create schema on, you can start inserting your data. Um, <clears throat> and once you've got your data, uh, you can query away. So um, on the um, on the IoTDB website, um, there is some sample data. Um, the sample data refers back to that original hierarchy that I uh, showed in the uh, first uh, couple of slides there. So uh, just keep that in mind when we go through um, some of the, uh, the demos here. Um, so just in terms of actually ingesting data into IODB, um, obviously, like I said, uh, there is the command line interface. Uh, you can use that to insert data. Uh, it's, not, um, it's not advisable, it is quite slow. Uh, I inserted the um, the sample data set, which I think is about sixty thousand rows, and it, it took it took several minutes, you know, five or ten minutes. Um, so it was was quite slow, but that's not what it's meant for. Um, there are some flags in the in the CLI that um, you can use to uh, pull data in, like if you had a batch job which was pushing data in. So so that's useful. Um, the, the method that I'm using at the moment is uh, JDBC. So the, the JDBC um, is there for interoperability, uh, obviously, so that's really good. It's really easy. Um, it is a bit slower. Um, I haven't really hit any issues with um, data ingestion through JDBC yet, um, but, you know, I'm I'm only inserting several thousand um, records per minute at the moment. Um, but you know, moving on from that, uh, I would be looking at the the Java API. So the Java API is obviously a more native method of, of getting the data in there. It's a lot faster. Um, so that's kind of the recommended approach. Um, there is also an API for uh, writing directly to the um, the the files that store the data. So the they call that the the TS file API, so time series file API. Um, so that's the file format used by IOTDB. So there is, there is a Java library to, to to use that and interact directly with those files, but um, I haven't uh, looked at that yet. So 
Um, so just in terms of uh, a demo, um, what we've got here, um, this is the IOTDB um, directory as, as you would download it. So this is uh, pretty vanilla. I haven't um, done much uh, to this. Um, in the uh, SBIN folder, uh, we have a couple of um, bash scripts and batch files. So obviously I'm on um, Windows here, so I'm just gonna use the batch files. Uh, so I've got some command prompts up here. So to start the server, um, we just go start server.bat um, and that would actually start the server up. So you can see it's, uh, see it's running there. And then on the right here, um, we can start up the uh, the CLI. So so the CLI starts up. Um, you get your little um, little logo there with the version number. So this is eleven point four, and it says login successful. Um, so obviously, being a command line interface, you're kind of um, flying a little bit blind here. Um, so once you're in here you can execute um, commands um, even if it's uh, you know plain sql so i'm just going to flick back to um to uh, the slides uh, before we carry on with the demo so in order to create a time series um, it's literally a command that says you know create time series and then that fully qualified um, uh, path that we spoke about earlier so you know, if, if you traverse the, the hierarchy here, you can see it's uh, root.ln.wf01wt01 and then status. So that, that's kind of this, this tree traversal over here. Um, but you can see uh, we need to create a time series for each of those um, sensors or those fields um, that we're going to store, store data in. Um, and then at the end here, you can see that we specify the data type. Um, th this is optional. So if you don't specify the data type, it will kind of infer the data type from um, the data that you send it. Uh, so that's important with that um, concept of auto create um, schema. So if you auto create the schema, you, you may not end up with the correct data type. Um, I haven't really had any occurrences where that happens. Um, most of the data that I send is, is kind of in floats or doubles. Um, but obviously if I send an integer, it doesn't know if it's a float or a double. So usually it just ends up with a float. Uh, so yeah, so that's um, creating the time series, um, SQL statements. Um, and then once we uh, have that time series, we can then insert data. Um, and like I said earlier, uh, inserting the data is just, you know, simple SQL uh, because we're, we're using either the CLI or, or JDBC, which makes it um, very appealing. It, it's just kind of um, native uh, SQL looking statements. Um, the only thing, you know, that you need to remember is that we're inserting into that device and then with a timestamp and a status um, value, which is, uh, which is what we have there. Uh, so <clears throat> once we have um, some data in there, which um, I was going to do this uh, <laughs> live, but like I said, it, it was taking five to 10 minutes. So um, I'm not going to uh, bore you with that. So once we have that, um, you know, like I said earlier, we're flying blind here, um, but we can do certain things like show time series. So if we execute that statement, um, this will give us a list of all of the, um, the time series um, that we've set up. So, you know, we've got our root.lnwfo2 wto2 status. Um, we can see the storage group, the data type, the encoding, and the compression. So you can see it's all set to snappy. Uh, so that's good. Um, there obviously are some um, additional ways to filter down what time series you're looking for. You know, so if we're looking for um, things that are under um, our SGCC, um, layer, we can do show time series root dot sgcc dot star. So the dot star is obviously just a, a wild card. And then when we do that, we'll see that under sgcc, we've got um, that WF03 um, WT01 device uh, and the temperature and status. So <clears throat> this 
this comes in handy um, uh, navigating your data or trying to um, find out what data is there because like I said earlier you are kind of flying blind um, if you don't know what data is there so these these queries are important um, <clears throat> and and like I said with the uh, with the star um, we can do other queries as well so if we want to find all of the um, sensors uh, or you know time series that have the name status uh, we can do that so it's just root dot star dot star dot star dot status and then that will return all of the um the status sensors for us so you know um in in my case obviously i'm trying to find all of the cpu values for all of the servers so this is the kind of query um that i would need to run to get that to, to find out what hosts are there um so the other <clears throat> the other important query is um the show devices query so if we run show devices um this will actually show the devices for us um the the other thing to take into account here is that anytime you run one of these queries it is fully qualified so you know in in terms of um the the stuff that i'm doing uh, I just want the host name, right? So I would then have to, um, you know, break this um, full, fully qualified device name into the path, well, you know, into components and then extract the last element, which is basically the device. So everything's always fully qualified. So, so show devices will just show all devices. Um, and then again, you know, we can we can filter it by different things. So if we want to only see the devices under SGCC, we can do that. Um, yeah. So so once we once we kind of have a handle on on what data is there, um, then we can start looking at um, additional additional queries. You know, like uh, if we want to find the last last status um, for a particular device. We can run that, and we can see that the um, the last status for this device was was false. Um, and the other thing you'll you'll notice here is that uh, although I said select last status, um, we actually have the the time value as well. So so when you run a lot of these queries, um, the the time field will be there uh, automatically. So just keep that in mind as well. So yeah, so here's a, a kind of um, uh just a, a you know uh, th those queries that i went through so we looked at show time series we looked at show devices um i didn't show you uh, show child paths but but basically you can use show child paths to uh traverse through the um through the hierarchy um, and carry on with that um so getting on to some some more exciting queries um we can do things uh like um looking for the last value and the last status so for a particular device so we can say select last value temperature last value status from the device and then we get the last temperature and the last status um, we can look for uh, the the max time oops that one didn't work let me try another one all right there we go so so this one um we just said select max time from status so this one we're, we're looking for the last time a status value was was inserted um uh, into that time series so when we do this uh you know we can look for things like well is that device offline because we haven't received a status in the last five minutes or something like that um and and these functions are are uh, a little bit um different from what you would kind of see in um normal sql so again you know that one was max time this one is max value so i can see well what was the max value for the temperature so this was the maximum temperature um of all time basically because we didn't um constrain constrain that um so that's what that, those queries are there all right, so um, just in terms of uh, IoT DB in context of the um, remote management system, uh, sorry, remote monitoring system, um, uh, the, the the way that um, I structured the the schema is is probably a little bit a um, little bit different. Um, 
but as you can see on the right hand side here um, we've got the organization um, I've, I've categorized things by device so um, CPU is a is a device um, and I, I know it's it kind of flies in the face of, of what I was saying earlier that the device is, is always that that last thing in in the hierarchy um, so but I'll, I'll show you why I, why I did that in a minute but basically we've got the organization device CPU default and then the the actual device so this um, uh, OPE and Z04, that's the actual host. And then we have CPU percent, um, which is the, the where we're store, storing the time series. So we can run um, some queries. Um, so like I said earlier, there, there isn't a, a user interface, um, but I've actually built my own one. Um, so th the reason I did that was so that I can actually traverse through the um, through through the hierarchy and and like I said uh, a minute ago, you know I've I've got this um, layer called device which is a little bit um, not right, but um, then we've got CPU and then we've got default um, and then we've got our hosts underneath there. And the the reason I did this was so that. Um, I can query this data out later for alerts um, by using a, a standard pattern. So um, it's the CPU or the disk. And then when we have the disk, we can see the drive letter or, or the path. And then from down from there, we can see the, um, uh, the, the actual device or, or the host. And same for, same for network um, and then also for, for RAM. Um, all right. So... Uh, in terms of querying the data out, <clears throat> if we wanted to see um, the CPU usage for a for a particular device, um, we can query that out. Uh, the query is pretty straightforward. We just go select from um, our device. Uh, we select star from our device. Um, I'm ordering by time, uh, and I've got a limit of 100. So we, if we run that, um, it comes back and it gives us all of our time values and all of our um, CPU percentage values. And obviously these are in um, descending order there. So, and it's the last 100. So that's great. Um, that kind of makes sense. Um, but what, what, what would you do if you want to see uh, CPU for all of your devices? Uh, so, you know, you, you would think that you would do something, something like this, where we go select last value CPU percent um, from device and then we just put a star on the end and and this query is actually valid but when we run it um, you'll see that that it actually puts the the time series in a in a horizontal row so if you wanted to access this through JDBC um, you would need to iterate through the fields which is obviously not uh, not ideal but you know you can see here that um, it's got the fully qualified path there um, and you can see that the, the device name is there. So this isn't ideal for uh, querying the data out. So, you know, what is the, the correct query for getting the CPU for all your devices? Um, and that's where this query comes in. So another important um, query statement here is this um, statement that says align by device. So if we run this statement now, <clears throat> and we have um, a line by device. If we run that, um, now what you see is that on in the left-hand side there, the first field is the device name, so fully qualified again, and then we've got the last CPU value for, um, for, that, uh, for that device. So this is another important query that you need to know, a line by device, and that will kind of um, pivot the data so that it's in a, a nice um, you know, table with, with rows. So that's an important one there. Um, so carrying on from that, um, the next query is, you know, how do you get CPU values for the past week? Uh, and this is another um, really good thing with um, IoTDB uh, is that we can use these kind of um, uh, relative <clears throat> time queries. So, you know, we're saying select um, CPU percent uh, from our device um, and we can say where time is greater than now and then now minus seven days So so this is how we get CPU for the last seven days so we can query this um, And this will go back and get us 
all of the CPU values for every 15 seconds for the last um, seven days. So it pulls, pulls back all of that data. It's really quick um, and that, that's great. So um, this is another important one. It's using those relative um, queries. So rather than having to rely on um, working out, you know, what the what the epoch was seven days ago, you just say now minus seven days, and, th and that that's great. It also takes away um, a lot of the time conversions um, because the the hosts that I'm monitoring are in different time zones. So um, uh, I just you know don't worry about that. I just say last seven days, and it will pull all that data back. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, another uh, another important thing um, is um, is aggregating the data or, or downsampling the data, um, and this is this is really important. So you know, like I just showed you, that there is this query that I just ran that says, you know, give me all of the CPU data for the last seven days, and when we run that, you know, we get thirty eight thousand records, um, which is not which is not great, um, especially when you're trying to put this on a chart. So you know there there is this concept in IoTDB about downsampling the the data, um, which is really powerful. So basically, you know we can say, well, we want the data from the last seven days, but we want to downsample it to um, uh, to one day or one hour. So in this particular case, I'm downsampling to one day. Um, we can execute this query, and then we get um, the average CPU per day um, for that particular host. You know, and, and we could change this to you know, per hour if we want and run that and then that will um, give us uh, an hourly basis, uh, well, you know, an, an average per hour for those, uh, for those records. Um, all right, so um, just before I show you some of the charts, um, this is another important query. So like, like I said earlier, uh, the way that I structured the schema um, was um, motivated by the the, the, re the requirement to pull the data out. So, um, and again, not knowing what was there, um, it's important to know things like well, what what disks are attached to um, to a device. So again, we can use the the show devices um, query um, to actually give us. Uh, all of the disks which are attached to a particular device. So all I said there was, well, you know, um, uh, root.org.device.disk, and then I've got a star there. So the star will obviously just bring everything back and then the particular device. So I've got the particular host there, and then that returns um, those three records. So we've got a C, D, and E, and then obviously I need to... Um, you know, uh, split that uh, fully qualified path out and get the um, the 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 the, um, the disk names uh, or the paths. Um, all right, so uh, not that one. All right, so just just in terms of um, actually querying the data out from the front end. So this is the this is the front end. Uh, so this is some CPU data here. You can see um, this is the last hour. Um, but we can do things, you know, like last six hours, last 12 hours, last day, last week. And these queries are going back to the server every time and executing a query. So it is really fast. Um, you know, we can say last four weeks um, and, uh, you know, it's pretty, pretty much instant. So this isn't local data. The server's um, actually in a different country. So I'm in New Zealand. This the server's in Sydney, so there is a bit of latency there. But you can see how fast it is just pulling this data back. Um, it's just just incredible. So, so the data is obviously downsampling, so it's not bringing back thirty eight thousand records every time. Um, and you know we can see for memory as well. Uh, last four weeks, um, it's it's just really really good. Um, all right, so uh, I think we're almost out of time. So it's just in terms of some of the disadvantages. <laughs> so there, there are some new SQL statements to learn. Um, some of them are a bit quirky, like the uh, the, the downsampling um, group by that I showed you earlier. So there are some nuances that you need to know about that. Um, the other thing, um, which is kind of in, in line with other time series databases is there's no update statement. So you can insert data, um, you can delete data, 
um, but there's no update, which is which is fair enough because there are no primary keys to speak of. So it doesn't really make sense that you would want to do an update. Um, I did ask the uh, um, the the developers whether you know doing a uh, delete and an insert is okay, but they said, well, you know, if you're doing that. Um, uh you, you're creating overhead for the server to 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 manage that um so just keep that in mind um there are some other disadvantages uh, and some of these have kind of been addressed um but uh early on i i tried to uh store for instance the the disk name in a field um but soon discovered that there's no distinct function so you can't for example rely on querying a column and saying, well, give me all of the distinct um, disk names or disk paths um, because you can't do that. So so that's why I came up with that schema, uh, that hierarchical schema to, to actually store the, um, the disk name in there. Um, but uh, some of these have been addressed through user-defined functions. Um, so uh, in version 12, there are user-defined functions which are written in Java. Um, there's a link there to quite a good um, library that someone is building, and there is a distinct function in there. So, you know, some of these disadvantages are, are quickly going away. Uh, in terms of advantages, um, like I said earlier, it's really fast, it's really scalable, it's really resilient. I've, I've had, you know, literally no problems with, with IoTDB, it's great. Um, but the 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 most important thing for me was um, that data growth. So, like I said in in the very first slide, um, I have, I was monitoring ten servers and I was already up to you know uh, five gigs of data uh, for thirty days. Um, I just checked uh, last night and I'm currently monitoring fifty servers. There's ninety days worth of data. Um, and it's only consuming 1.24 gigabytes worth of data, which is just amazing. Um, and, you know, going back to uh, if I was to store that in a relational database, I would probably be looking at something like 75 gigabytes worth of data, which which is not a lot. But, you know, if, if this was scaled to a thousand servers, then obviously, you know, that's going to be terabytes worth of data, which is just not uh, not uh, not conducive to anything. Um, so just uh, just to wrap up um, some tips and uh, lessons learned. Um, so the main one there is your, your device is always the last thing in that path. Um, so that, that's important so that you can use that show devices query. Um, and, uh, you know, like, like I said earlier, you know, th there are some things which you would think would be a device like a, a disk, but the device is the the host or the server in my case so device is not always device um, the other thing to keep in mind is avoid ins inserting out of sequence data so you, time series database um, expects the data to be inserted sequentially so you know older data always goes in first um, if you don't do that IOTDB will resequence the data um, but it does cause uh, additional overhead on the server. So, um, yeah, so just keep that in mind. It's not not advisable. Um, the other tip, like I mentioned earlier, is, is use that auto-create schema if you need a flexible schema or um, you don't know what the schema is going to look like um, up front. Uh, and, and this is kind of one of the mistakes that, that I'm kind of, that, that I made myself. Um, you know, a lot of the queries that I showed earlier um, you know, I had CPU PCT um, because I was kind of in that mindset of, of keeping things short, um, but there's no overhead in, in naming your sensors or naming your time series with a with a nice name. So, you know, if, if I were to go back uh, a year, I would call it CPU dash percent and not not abbreviate. So so name your name your sensors or name your time series. Um, with a nice name because there's no overhead. It's just part of the path. You're not storing that data anywhere. Well, you're not storing that field name multiple times. Um, and then, yeah, so another another tip is it's easier to rely on those time offsets instead of saying, you know, time greater than X, time less than Y. So a lot of, a lot of the original queries that I'd written for the application um, to query the data out was relying on those time um, offsets, so time greater than, time less than, and I've kind of slowly been moving those over to use those time offsets, 
which is uh, which is really good. Um, and yeah, like I said earlier, using um, downsample um, is really good. Um, and just the last one there is avoid invalid or reserved characters in layers and devices. So <clears throat> the the dot is a is a reserved character because it makes up that that hierarchical path. So <laughs> that's caused a few problems for me because if somebody if an agent sends through a fully qualified host name with the domain obviously those are dot separated and then that thinks um that it's part of the hierarchy because we have the auto schema turned on um so it creates this hierarchical schema which i wasn't expecting and that broke some of the queries so you know just keep that uh, keep that in mind um and that's yeah that's kind of it um so uh are there any questions? Go to the Q and A. <laughs> so, uh, in terms of high availability, uh, high availability and cluster installation, um, yes, there is. Uh, so um, it, it is, uh, you can set up highly, avail highly available um, clusters. Um, so that, that's um, part of the, the default, um, uh, you know, functionality that's there. I haven't done that myself, but um, essentially what you do is, is set up a synchronization between um, two instances um, and then, yep, so that's for there. Uh, so in terms of recommendations for running tests as part of my CICD with time series database, um, I haven't really had a need to run tests like that. Um, you know, the, the agent just kind of sends the data. Um, so I'm, I'm not doing any, um, you know, quality, quality assurance on the, the data um, itself. Um, the agent has very little configuration. Basically, all, all you nominate is, is where, the, the, where the data is going to and, and some security tokens. Um, so I'm not doing any profiling or or any um, uh, you know testing on the on the data itself. Um, yeah, so if that uh, answers that, cool. So yeah, so here's just uh, a few more bits of the uh, of the application. Um, you know, for any of these servers, uh, we can look at some some charts for the AEM. So this is the CPU for the past week. This is the memory. Uh, this is the network send and receive. Um, this is the the disk. So so this is what I was referring to earlier. Is actually. <laughs> because I don't know ahead of time what um, what disks are actually attached to a machine, um, I rely on those queries like show device to actually pull out um, the, the drive leaders or, or the drive paths. Um, and then, you know, this is this is another. So this this is basically a, um, ping results. Um, so th this data gets collected every 15 seconds as well. And then, you know, this is a, a week's worth of, of ping data. So you can see that there was some irregularity with the uh, with the pings there. Um, yeah, so I think that's it. Thank you very much for uh, for coming, everyone. <laughs>